And here we are in studio in Loveland, Colorado. And I don't know what's going on in this studio, but it is hotter in here than like a ditch digger's armpits. It is so hot in here and wet. And I don't know what it is. I don't know. Maybe it's just because you're hot. Oh, I don't know. You're think hot so. and you brought your heat in here, but do you find it a little bit warm? Yeah, well, it's because we can't have ventilation in the studio or the mics would pick it up. Uh, so there's no airflow. I want more air conditioning in here. It's hotter than blazes. I I um I'm tempted to take off my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we do have cameras rolling. Yeah, would, we do have cameras rolling. I'd take off my shirt and mm-hmm. I wish I'd worn shorts. I um I do have boxer shorts. Let's not. And that's under the desk. That's fair game. Yeah? I think that's fair game. No. I know it's time to start the show. I heard the music, and I shouldn't be talking about such things. But I don't know. I find it insufferably hot in here. Is it hot in the control room? Yeah, you guys always. actually open the door, because it does get warm in that control room with all the equipment. And uh, you get to open the door. If we open the door, that apparently ruins the show. Mm-hmm. So we can't do that. So, Okay, we're live on the air. Here's something I'm looking at. And I normally, I would never, ever plug somebody's product ever unless they paid us to plug it on this show. Go ahead, pay me to plug your product on the show. That's fine. Um, But here, I, you know, I'm a bit of an audiophile. I love listening to music and good music. Mm -hmm. And so I have a decent pair of headphones. They're not like $1,000 headphones, but I have a decent pair of headphones. And I was looking at, you may as well know what I was looking at and about to approach you to get permission to buy was a DAC. What's a DAC? Well, it's a digital to analog converter. It takes all the little ones and zeros of your music and turns them back into an analog signal. Okay. And there's good ones and there's cheap ones. And Mm -hmm. the cheap ones sound really bad. Mm -hmm. And the good ones will take a nice pair of headphones and make them sound astonishing. Astonishing. And so I was going to get an external. But as you know, I'm also a Mac fanboy. Mm -hmm. And there's a fairly decent DAC, a DAC, inside a Mac. Ha, I made a little poem there. (laughs) And so there's a DAC in the Mac that's pretty... Smack. <laughs> I don't even know if wow. that's. A, I You're see. A poet no, her, no Harim's actually shaking his head at how sorry that was. Um, pretty smack. Smack is actually drugs, isn't it? Uh, I we don't do don't smack know. around here. Anyway, so I found this app, and I like. I don't know if I should say it. What it is, I won't you, because we shouldn't plug no. it. No. Okay. It may or may not be called Boom, and uh, <laughs> and I plugged this thing in, and I had Natalie listen, and you think that your music sounds good. Till you put this on, and now it's driving my headphones, and it, it's gorgeous. It's like, well, I had Natalie listen because she loves music too, and she mm-hmm. said, um, "Dad, it's like glasses for your ears." Ooh, this good is amazing. I don't know how they're doing it, mm-hmm. but it's pretty amazing. So, you're lucky. I bought an app instead of a um, a new amplifier, <laughs> so an I'm external lucky. amplifier. That's, that's yeah, good. you're lucky that good I didn't. <laughs> Well, as you know, men's toys are more expensive. Definitely. Stuff. Anyway, that is not our topic. I just got derailed a little bit. I think it's the incredible heat in the studio. Could be. Could that be. is driving me a little a little wacky. Uh-huh. Because, as you know, Canadians don't like heat. No. Nope. Generally, nope, we nope, don't. Nope, nope, nope. I like the house at 60 degrees. I, that is well, ideal. I, I am also Canadian, and I don't like the house at 60 degrees. No? No. You do, too, 68. for sleeping. I've got you down to about 65 at night. For sleeping, I agree. Yeah, and colder. then you get under a warm quilt, Yeah. and you're gone. And you feel, ah. Oh. Yeah, but you can fall <laughs> asleep in a seatbelt. Pretty much. Yeah, sitting up. The uh, older I get, le- the less I'm able to do that. Hallelujah. But. Maybe the older I get, the more I'll sleep. I average four to five hours a night, and you mm-hmm. average a lot more than that, I think. Oh, yeah. I I mean, if I get six hours of sleep in a night, that's a short night for me. I usually get my seven or eight. Wow. Easily. And I just watch you sleep. Pretty much. And then I yeah. get up and wander around the house, and then you get mad. <laughs> <laughs> because I woke you up. All right, not our subject. We're actually going to talk about, I know that you you go down into the kitchen mm-hmm. and you've got your place and it's inviolable. I'm not allowed there in the mornings. You're at one end of the, we don't really have a dining room table because we have a, well, we have a dining room table, but it's in the kitchen. Yeah, we have a little nook yeah. that and so fits you, in. Yeah, you sit in mm-hmm. the nook and you've got your Bible open and I know that's your time. I try not to disturb you, although I do come and admire you once in a while for Sometimes. a minute. Yeah, well, I'm still in love with you. I still <laughs> like you. I I, you know, it's good to know. Getting up in the morning, and, and I still am amazed. How did I land this girl? Oh. So, But you're there, and you're studying your Bible, and you've got several. You 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 use your Bibles till they're so marked up that there's no more room for marks, and then you move on to the next one. And then I start another one. one. Yeah. yeah, I do. And so lately, you've been in the book of Jeremiah. Right. And, uh, and I know that you have found this. I, I know. I think you found Jeremiah especially rewarding. What prompted you to study that book? You know, we're getting personal here, I guess, but I, I don't mind admitting what I've been in. I've been in first and second 
uh, Kings and First and Second Chronicles mm. lately mm. for mm-hmm. my study. But Jeremiah, you you went there and you mm-hmm. lingered there. Why? Mm. What what brought you there? You know, I did. Uh, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. That's been my favorite Bible verse for a long time. Yes, it has. Um, and I'll just share it with our listeners in case they haven't heard it. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And I love that verse. And so really, how did I stumble on Jeremiah, though? It, I'm doing a program where I just read through the entire Bible, a book at a time. It's not so Bible So that's when you got, year. did you start at Genesis? And, yeah, yeah, a book at a time. And I not completely in order. I, I jump around. I, t- I like to alternate as best I can between Old and New Testament. But I read a whole book, and then I move on to another whole book, not necessarily in the right order. Um, and Jeremiah was next on my list. And I, but as you said, uh, I did linger there, and it was really you've been meaningful there forever. To, you've been in Jeremiah forever. Well, I finished, I finished it, and I went back, and then I moved on, and I'm now in Ezekiel, which is a lot heavier than Jeremiah. <laughs> I don't know, but um, same period. Same period, it's same, ex- it's exile another literature. prophet, yeah. he's the prophet that's in exile, Well, one is Jeremiah. pre-exile, one is here's what's going to happen to you, and, and one here's, is here's what happened to you. Or what's, well, Ezekiel starts pre, but from the perspective of being in exile, not right. going into. So anyway, but, you know, I, I really I really enjoyed Jeremiah. I just did. And I spent a lot of time there. And it's a long book of the Bible. There are 52 chapters. That's and one so, a week. Yeah, but I, I read it. I, I read at my own pace. I don't try and follow a schedule where you read the Bible, the whole Bible in a year. I have done that in the past, but I find what works better for me is I read I commit to a book, and I I kind of go deep in that book. And when I'm done, I move on to the yeah. next book. If it takes longer than a year, it takes longer. If it takes less, well, it takes less. I know of a wise Christian woman who once said, you know, it's better to slow down and take a little bit of Scripture and actually digest it and contemplate it and make it a part of who you are than to read giant swaths of Scripture. And mm-hmm. I think I agree with that. Yeah. Well, and it's not a checklist for me. I, I don't want my worship time to be something I have to cross off the list to get on with the rest of my day. It's something I do because I want to, and I want to spend time with God. Hmm. And that, that's that's a key difference for and I'm me sure too. God doesn't want to be treated as a checklist no, either. No, of course not. He, All right, he here I am. To spend time this with is him. mandatory. Yeah. It'd be like your kids, you want them to hang out with you. Okay, I'm here at 6 o'clock. You got till 6, 10. Yeah. And then Hurry I'm going up. out with my friends. Hurry up with this thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and, and that doesn't no. work that way. All right, so well, Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, it really, (laughs) it checked all the boxes for me of what I really enjoy studying in the Bible. There's really good history in this book. Yeah, my history major wife. Yes, and Mm -hmm. you know I love history. And, you know, it's set during a really pivotal, pivotal. (laughs) (laughs) I can't believe you just did that. That is awesome. I'm the one who mispronounces words. Pivotal is is metric English. It's Canadian for pivotal. Yeah. Yeah. Pivotable. Long. Okay, so it's pivotable. Okay. It's p- <laughs> <laughs> an important time period, um, not only for Judah and for Israel, but this is an important time period globally. And another checkbox is that this book, Jeremiah, is full of encouragement. You know, there are all kinds of calls to action uh, about your heart and and about praying, about your relationship with God. Jeremiah spends a lot of time on that. Now, I love reading that in the Bible. I love reading Psalms, where you find a lot of that as well. And, of course, Jeremiah also reflects a lot on his calling, on his role as a prophet. And, you know, I found in his very honest discussions with God, Jeremiah, that are recorded here, he's talking about what it's like to be in ministry, what those challenges are, what those um, things that really draw him into that work are. And it was, I found a lot of correlations to our own life, Sean, you and I being in ministry together. Hmm. And Jeremiah isn't just rich with history. There's prophecy there too. Deep, deep prophecy. Of course, I love that part. Yeah. God's plan for the future. I know, I know, unless we did a 52 part series, we're not going to get through all 52 chapters today. And, and we're we're barely going to scrape the surface on this. I know that. Mm -hmm. So I guess we got no choice. Let's look at the highlights. What really stood out to you? Because I know I could watch you. You were being deeply moved at points as you were going through this book. You mentioned the historical setting of the book. So maybe let's, let's start with the history. What's going on in the world when this book is written? You've kind of touched on it, but this is big. Yeah. Um, The book was written at, (laughs) 
a very interesting time. This is the time of the divided kingdom. If we remember, Israel is now divided between Israel and Judah. Right. And just your libertarian style husband wants to point out that that happened over a tax issue. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a that's a good yeah. little Rehoboam side note. decided Got to it. nail them with taxes, and they said, "We're out of here. We're out of here." Yeah. yeah it sounds. Mm, there are some there correlations there uh, between us and them. Now, Israel had been conquered by the Assyrians at Ouch. that point. Ouch. The nation <laughs> to the north. And many of the Israelites at this point are in captivity, so they've been taken from their homeland yeah, already. Even, even worse than that, the, I think the Assyrians had the habit of removing you to another part of the world and then replacing you with foreigners, yeah. which is where the Samaritans end up coming in. Right, yeah. that's true. There you go. All right. Yeah, we talked about that. That when is we Sean's about the historical nugget, and now back to Jane. <laughs> okay. So Jeremiah is a prophet in Judah. He is located in Jerusalem, and he's called to be a prophet in the year 627 BC. And Jeremiah prophesies and he preaches for 40 years. And these are 40 tumultuous years. These are not years of peace. This is not when you want to be a prophet. It's a difficult time, and yeah. it's a really difficult calling on him to do this. This time period, I think of as a lot of lasts. We see a lot of last things happening okay. because it's a transitionary time. So in 640 BC, Josiah began his reign as king of Judah. Now, of course, remember, Sean, he was the boy king. He became king when he was eight years old. Mm-hmm. And we love to tell our kids that story yep, because it's king. a boy that they can kind of relate to. I'm kind of to. the boy it's king really in our cool. house, though. I am the boy king. You're the only male in our yeah. house. That okay. is true. So the eight-year-old yeah. king, Josiah. Mm-hmm. So his father, Manasseh, he was not a good king. Uh, he allowed, in fact, he instituted idolatry. But then his son Josiah comes along and he's nothing like his father. And so Josiah sets out to kind of course correct. He wants to right the wrongs of his father. So he goes about, he tears down the altars to Baal. He reverses a lot of the practices of the time. Now his father had abandoned the book of the law, but providentially a scroll is found during Josiah's time. Remember that. And so Josiah now hears the words from the scroll. And this scroll is essentially the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy as we know them today. Mm -hmm. And so at first, what happens is he as a person is changed by this. He, the scriptures just transform him personally, and then it sparks a reformation in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so Josiah is a good king, but as I said, it's a period of lasts. He is the last good king of Judah. That's an interesting lesson that you have there. I know we have to take a break in a second before we keep going, but personal uh, reformation among God's people, revival doesn't happen because you crack down on others. Revival starts with you. Absolutely. And so you open your Bible, you let God transform you, and then the influence spills over onto those around you who become curious, what happened to you? Mm -hmm. What Mm -hmm. is going on in your life? So I found that interesting. Josiah starts by being transformed by God himself through the scriptures, and then uh, it sparks reformation across God's people. So Mm -hmm. I hear the music. That means I'm going to have to push the pause button on this. We're going to come right back. We're talking about, well, Jean's study of the book of Jeremiah and why she finds it so moving and transforming herself. Get a pen and paper, write down these amazing offers from the people at The Voice of Prophecy. We'll be right back with more of the book of Jeremiah. Grab your Bible. We'll be right back. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. And we're 
we're back from the break. Did you see what I did during the break? I pretended there was a problem with the equipment so they would come and open the door and let all the hot air out of here. <laughs> no, there kind of was. Did you hear something weird yeah. in your headphones? Yeah, there was some sort of digital noise and we were trying to figure out if a phone was ringing somewhere. It just yeah. went and we didn't quite figure it out. But the but noise But the noise ended. is gone and we got the door open and got the hot air out of here. A little bit. Yeah, the hot mm-hmm. air, which I mostly generated and you didn't. <laughs> talking about Jeremiah, and I want to just sort of turn it back over to you. This has been your study, and we're talking about what's going on in Israel at the mm-hmm. time that Jeremiah is called to his 40-year prophetic ministry. It's not a happy time. Right. And so away you go. Okay. Well, uh, when we left off, we were in the reign of Josiah, the last good king of Judah. He came to the throne at age eight. We remember him as the boy king. And so Jeremiah and other prophets before him, they preach and they prophesy that in spite of this revival of faithfulness that began under Josiah, that Judah as a nation had turned its back on God. And so God tells Josiah the king that because of his faithfulness, that he would in fact Uh, not allow Josiah to witness this predicted and this prophesied downfall Hmm. of his city. And so that's recorded for us in 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings 22 and verse 20 says this, Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. So this is God's promise to Mm -hmm. Josiah. And your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. And so interestingly, this kind of— The good news is you're going to die. Well, you're going to you're going to die before all of this comes to pass right. and you Josiah will die in peace. And uh, what I found interesting about that account is very much in the book of Jeremiah, we we see Jeremiah the prophet's relationship, his personal relationship with God reflected. And we see here a little glimpse of that of God's personal relationship not with Josiah as king of Judah, but with Josiah the man and he promised his that he will spare him, that seeing what will happen to his country. So Josiah, the last good king of Judah, he died at the Battle of Megiddo. And those of us who are students of prophecy, that sparks a few uh, points of remembrance, the Battle of Megiddo. He battles against the Egyptians. He dies at the age of 39. Right. No, no, th- th- there's the point here. So here's a good man who dies at 39, and that's actually a good thing, mm-hmm. which underlines this fact that we can argue with God all we want about what's right and just in this world, but sometimes what looks bad from this side was merciful. Absolutely. Absolutely. We 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 don't have the privilege of seeing things the way God right. sees if them. If we could see the end from the beginning, mm-hmm. we often say as Christians, we wouldn't change anything that God did. And in this case, 39, I passed that mark a long time ago. If I knew I was going to die at 39, I'm not sure I would take that as good news from God. No, right. But in this case, he spared seeing the complete dissolution of God's people. Yeah, because Josiah was a good man. So would I rather good sleep man. and miss that? Or yeah. yeah. And he dies in battle. Yeah. That's also probably not a happy death. Do we no. know how he died? I can't remember how he died. Yeah, um, probably not great. Yeah, I'd Because have to look that battle up. deaths are seldom good ones. Seldom pleasant. Yeah, they, true. No one ever just lets you die of old age on the field. Mm-mm. No. No. <laughs> and, and, and this continued with his son. So um, after he dies, his son Jehoahaz, he becomes the next king of Judah, and he's taken into captivity in Egypt. And then the pharaoh places another of Josiah's sons, Jehoiakim. So you see all these J names <laughs> that kind of become a jumble yeah. a little bit when you're studying. But Jehoiakim is placed on the throne in Judah. And you know, Sean, sadly, Jehoiakim is nothing like his father, Josiah. He actually goes about and makes it his mission to undo all the reforms that Josiah put in place, undoing the things his father did. Um, So Judah takes quite a huge step backwards. Warning to Christian families, it only takes one generation to undo what God has done through the generation before you. One. Yeah. One. Absolutely. All and right, we you, see that in the reign of the kings. Yeah. You've mentioned the Assyrians, one mm-hmm. of my favorite peoples. I was okay. recently in the British Museum touring the Assyrian section. I probably mm. like it because they were nasty. You know, they were just <laughs> nasty people. They didn't build their empire. They dominated it. Right. So they had already conquered Israel, the tribes mm-hmm. to the north. Mm-hmm. Uh, now the Egyptians attack Judah. They take a king captive, appoint another king. And historically, these are two fairly well-known empires, although I always argued that there was no such thing as a genuine empire till the Persians, but that's another that's another story. Another, but another Yeah, time. so you've got sure. Assyria to the north, Egypt to the south. You've got these two powers both vying for dominance, right? Yeah, absolutely. And 
this is nothing new. I mean, this has been going on for a while. These empires were conquering and fighting with Israel, with Judah, with each other. But what was new in Jeremiah's time and after Josiah, just as God had promised, was that a new empire arrived from the east. Right. This is the famous ones. These are the Mm -hmm. Babylonians. And they were rising to power because Nebuchadnezzar's father had actually wiped out the city of Assyria and put them back in their place. So now the Babylonians were free to rise to power. And here they come. Yeah, here they come from the east. The, yeah, but the Bible says they come from the north because they actually had to go up and then down to come east. Okay, that makes sense. Took a west, I mean, they rather. were located yeah, yeah, yeah. in the east. But okay, yeah. Babylonians. Yep. Yeah, and oftentimes uh, we just want to remember that when we're reading scripture, oftentimes the Babylonians are called the Chaldeans. Yep. So interchangeable, different name for the same group. Right. So now the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar, they push into Judah in 605 BC. And this is during the reign of Jehoiakim. And so quickly, the Babylonian Empire becomes the dominant one. They completely outpower the Assyrians and the Egyptians. And so now here we are back to our prophet. We're back to Jeremiah. He began in 627 BC to warn the people of Judah that if they did not abandon their current path of worshiping idols, and if they didn't return to God, that they would be conquered. And Judah, all of Judah, Jerusalem, the city, Solomon's temple, the beautiful temple built by Solomon, that all of it would fall. Okay, so now when Nebuchadnezzar attacks Judah in 605, Judah didn't fall, at least not completely. It didn't right. collapse at that point. Neither did really in the first wave a Jerusalem or the temple go down. Kind of a progression, right? It comes yeah. in waves. Absolutely. So it's not like it all happened at once. Babylon continued to push into Judah, and they conquered Judah in waves. And so all during this time, Jeremiah warns the people during all of it, you know, during that whole 40 years. And so during that first attack on Judah in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar carried away captives that he took back to Babylon, as you recall. But Jehoiakim, he stayed on the throne for another seven years. But he, even with all that was going on, everything he witnessed, he was an eyewitness to all of them. He ignored Jeremiah's prophecies about Hmm. Babylon. And in the end, he was killed just as Jeremiah predicted. Uh, In fact, in Jeremiah 22, verses 18 and 19, we read about this. Let's pick it up, Sean, in verse uh, 18. Okay. It says, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, my brother, or alas, my sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, master, or alas, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey. Oh, great. Yeah. Mm. So no honor, no honor. Dragged and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. Here's what's interesting. They're dragged out and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Where did Jesus bear the punishment of our sins? Uh Dragged out and punished outside of Jerusalem. So Mm -hmm. the ultimate punishment for sin falls on Christ and not on us. But here here this demonstrates, at least in my mind, I know I'm interjecting here, but but this seems big to me, Mm -hmm. that you're dragged out, you will be dragged out and cast beyond the gates of Jerusalem. That is the rightful that is the rightful penalty that human beings deserve, cast out of God's city, out of God's kingdom, mm-hmm. dying an ignoble death because of sin. And when Jesus comes, that's precisely what we do with him, drag mm. him outside the city and put him to death in an ig- the most ignoble death we can think of. Mm-hmm. And he, he took it on willingly. Right. Yeah. Right. It, you know, and that, that just raises a broader point too, Sean. Part of why I love studying these books of the Old Testament is it helps me understand the New Testament, not just the prophecy portions like Revelation, but all of Scripture makes so much sense. It's so cohesive when you understand all of it, mm-hmm. and, and it brings it, it brings other books to light. And you cannot read the New Testament without understanding the Old. Jeremiah Absolutely. is important. I know we mm-hmm. often hand out New Testaments, but I think mm-hmm. you ought to read the whole thing because the New Testament is built on the Old, mm-hmm. and you can't truly understand that. Look at that verse. I mean— yeah. God was going to deal with wickedness. You're out of my city. You'll die the death, the wages of sin. And Jesus takes that for us. They literally take him outside the city and Mm -hmm. treat him like this. Mm 
Yeah. Fascinating. So it gives us a, a so Jehoiakim depth. Jehoiakim Kim with an M. Yes. Kim is out. And so Jehoia Chin succeeds, succeeds him. Succeeds him. Probably both are okay. But Nebuchadnezzar then attacks again. He, he and his army attack in 597 BC. And during this attack on Jerusalem, Jehoia Chin surrenders to Nebuchadnezzar's army. And so what do they do? They take him and other leaders in the court and several vessels from the temple, and they take them all back to Babylon. And so now the king is captive back in Babylon. Here, I I know, we're never going to get through this topic today, but I'm looking at Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim, M and N, and and as you get to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, Mm -hmm. it describes them as abominations. And so they commit these abominations, Mm -hmm. and the next thing you know, Nebuchadnezzar comes and leaves the temple desolate, takes everything out of it. This is the original abomination of desolation. desolation. That's That's what that term refers to. Right. Right. Yeah, it's deep. Understanding this history really does open up yeah, other absolutely. parts of Scripture. So mm-hmm. so Jeremiah, he continues to share his calls to the people. Repent. Um, turn back to God. He appeals to them. And so the next king that comes along, the next king of Judah, is in fact the last king mm. of Judah. So Nebuchadnezzar puts in power another of Josiah's sons, and his name is Mataniah. But we don't really know him as that because I don't know him as that. No, <laughs> because Nebuchadnezzar almost immediately changed his name, and we know him as the name that Nebuchadnezzar gave him. Boy, which Nebuchadnezzar is loved Zedekiah. changing names. He did. Remember, yeah. he did yeah, that yeah, to yeah. Daniel and his yeah, friends. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so Zedekiah, and like the other sons and the grandson of Josiah who ruled before him, Zedekiah did not listen to Jeremiah's prophecies, and we'll see that, Sean, as we continue to study. We'll see that clearly. And so ultimately, Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians in five because he didn't play nice, did he? BC. Yeah. Who didn't play nice? Zedekiah. Zedekiah. Oh, no. No, no. He didn't. He was a tax rebel. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. See, yeah. I, I managed to work in personal taxes twice into twice. one show. Twice. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Taxation is theft, people. <laughs> and I'll just keep moving yeah. along. Yeah. R- write your complaint letters to Gene <laughs> Booster Box 999, Loveland, Colorado. <laughs> oh. So let's go back to Babylon yeah, and Jerusalem yeah, Zedekiah. and Zedekiah. Sorry. So when the city falls, you know, it falls. Uh, the city is burned. Solomon's temple is destroyed. In fact, King Zedekiah has a very inglorious death. They gouge out his eyes and they take him captive to Babylon didn't before they he dies. Kill his kids in front of him first. Yeah, I didn't kill his kids uh, and then blind him. They did. They killed all his sons in yeah. front of him. They gouge out his eyes. They take him captive. Then he dies in captivity. So that's our last king of Judah is Zedekiah, of course, until you know we have King Jesus, the perfect king in the end. Right. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, so that's the historical Israel, background. Israel Sean. asked for a king. God said, this is a big mistake. They said, we don't care. We want a king. Yep. And then it slides downhill until we get to Zedekiah. Mm-hmm. And God now puts a pause. Israel has not really self-governed with a kingdom. There hasn't been another king on the throne of Israel. And God says, that's not right. until my son comes and I set up my kingdom again. Absolutely. Well, there's the music. Well, so, and kids, if you're listening and yeah. you are students of history, there's an easy way to remember the last king of Judah, Z, Zedekiah. Z is the last letter in the alphabet. We should have named a kid Zedekiah, except that, <laughs> it's cool you know, name. that no, it's not a happy story. Though. No, it's not. And of course, you're going to get picked on if you go to school and your name's Zedekiah and that's on your lunchbox. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps. All right. There's the music. We got to take a little break. And so we're going to open the door and cool off the studio one more time, and then my hot wife will heat it up again with her hot Bible study. We'll be right back. Disclosure is just one of the programs brought to you by the Voice of Prophecy, like the audio adventure program, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a weekly Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy faith-building stories with Jake Donovan, (laughs) Mr. Simon, and others in this small mountain town. Each summer, campers visit Discovery Mountain, where they sing songs, learn about God, and reenact a Bible story with the help of drama teachers, Miss Wendy and Miss Tamara. With 24 full episodes every year and programming every week, your family will have something uplifting to listen to every week. 
Listen to episodes on demand and watch video features from Director Doug at discoverymountain.com or on your favorite podcast platform. That's discoverymountain.com. You are welcome for me going and opening the studio Thank door you. Yeah, during the break. <laughs> I don't know. It's so hot in here. I'm almost ready to recant my position on purgatory. Man. Oh, no. Almost, almost. Almost. I'm willing to go back on it a little bit because if there is a purgatory, this is it right now here. Oh, yeah, my goodness. It's a little stuffy, yeah. to say the least. Jeremiah, we're going to look at the prophecies. Well, we might not even get there. Who knows? Who knows? Because you're so talkative. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you just fill up the time. But Tell me about Jeremiah the man, because I know you got attached to this Bible character as you've been studying about. Tell me what you know about him. Why does he matter to you? Well, and that's part of what really drew me into this book, because more than any other prophet, we get to see the man, and we get to see the person, the human, behind what's happening here in the history and the prophecies. Well, he pours his heart out a little more than others. Yeah. Yeah. And now, so we we still don't know a lot of details about his life, but we do know more about him than any of the other prophets. We know that he was a Benjamite, uh, so that means that he was trained from boyhood to be a priest. That's how he was raised. And God called Jeremiah to be a prophet when he was young. So in 627 BC, during Josiah's reign, Jeremiah is just a young man. And so this 40-year span is most of his adult life, if not all of it. So most prophets, so, we picture them with bearded, white beards and we stuff. Do, but but right? where do the, the old prophets have to come from somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, and, they got to be young prophets before they can be old ones. Right. He's just yeah. young. Okay. So let's look in the very first chapter of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter one, and we kind of get a picture of who he was right away. Let's look, Sean, starting in verse four. So Jeremiah one, verse four says, then the word of the Lord came to me, being Jeremiah, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. And so here, right away, we see the human element in Jeremiah's call to be a prophet, call to this ministry life. He hesitates. He doesn't feel worthy of this. And I know so many of us experience this. I've experienced this personally. But instead, God responds to him. He answers him. Verse 7. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth, huh. for you you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. I mean, what a calling that is on this young man. And then God shows him what his ministry is going to be about. This is not an easy calling. This is not a light calling. Mm -hmm. There's a warning cry that destruction is coming, but it's a call to repentance and of hope too, as we see. Let's skip down to verse 10. See, I have this day, and this is God again speaking to Jeremiah, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And so a few verses later, we see a snapshot of what Jeremiah's specific role is going to be in this period in Judah's history. And God starts again by encouraging the prophet that he will be with him. So here, let's move down to verse 18. Okay. For God says, For behold, I have made you this day, you, Jeremiah, a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against this whole, against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against its priests, and against the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Now, wait a minute. So you look at this. Jerusalem's about to fall. It was supposed to be a beacon of God's love and a fortress of God's kingdom in this world. They're rebelling, and God Mm -hmm. almost narrows it all down. Okay, Jeremiah, now you are my city. Mm Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I'm going to reside the truth in you. My mm-hmm. words will be in your mouth. That tells me a lot about maybe the nature of Scripture, mm-hmm. that we should be very careful before we say God said this and God didn't say that. Absolutely. Right? But, but Absolutely. So he's like a mini Jerusalem. Yeah. He, 
his whole life and his whole experience um, in this book, Jeremiah the Man, reflects exactly what's happening in the country. And his whole life is, is like a symbol of what's happening to the nation. And, you know, God is right at the beginning telling him, this is not going to be easy for you, Jeremiah. No, it this costs will him cost something, right? You. Maybe that but bothers will, me a little bit, but what did, what did it cost him? What did it cost him? In the end? Well, altogether. I mean, I know that um, he didn't get to live a normal life. Right, he didn't. Jeremiah never marries. We're told that in Jeremiah chapter 16. Um, he is not popular. His, <laughs> it's not just, as you can imagine, and it's not just the kings and, and the people in power that are against him. We see in Jeremiah 12, his own family members persecuted him. And, you know, Jeremiah felt deeply. He's often called the weeping prophet because we see his emotions come out in this book. He feels deeply for his people, and he has such a deep connection with God that he pours this out openly. He pours out his sadness, his struggle, and and God personally answers him. He does. And, you know, some of this um, pouring out of Jeremiah of his heart to God, it's often called Jeremiah's confessions. And mm. that's something if we had a couple of hours, Sean, it would be really great to study because Jeremiah is pouring his heart out to God and God responds to him. It's powerful. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the weeping prophet, you know, I suspect, you know, this is not just Jeremiah weeping, but if he's putting, if God is putting his words in Jeremiah's mouth, we're seeing the heart of God break over sin. And God's not just angry about sin. I don't, I don't think we can avoid God gets angry about sin. There's no way to avoid that. However, if Jeremiah's weeping, it's because God's put his burden on Jeremiah, and now we can see God weeping over his people. God is weeping yeah. over Israel, and Israel represents each of us. Yeah. Absolutely. So Jeremiah is called to be a prophet during the final years of Judah before it falls to Babylon. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you have told me many times Jeremiah called his people to wholeheartedly serve God. Yes. That his messages call us to do the same now, that there's mm-hmm. a reason this book's still in the Bible for you and me. Mm-hmm. Uh, the call's still there. Yeah. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 4. Let's jump ahead just a little bit. Okay. Here's the Lord's message for Judah through his prophet. Uh, not easy, not easy for him to preach, and not easy for the people to hear. So let's look at Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 3. Okay. So it says, For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, And do not sow among thorns. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. We can read deeply into this. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. So what are we talking about here? We're not talking about the physical circumcision, which God asked his people to do, but we're talking about the circumcision of the The heart. heart. That's what we're talking about. And then it continues. You men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. So as you said, there are consequences for these sins and God outlines them. His people have turned their hearts away from him. They are worshiping false idols. They have a whole system of false worship. And you know, God is just. This sin can't go unchecked. You know, there have to be consequences. And yet, and yet, in these consequences, there is hope. And there is an option to avoid all of this. And here it continues, verse 14. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? And so Jeremiah calls out for his people to repent, to wash their hearts of wickedness. So we're talking not just about their outward actions. We're talking about um, where their hearts lie, who they worship, who they are loyal to. And how do the people do that? How, how do we today repent and wash our hearts of wickedness? Do we clean ourselves up? Is that what Jeremiah was telling the people to do? Well, no. And we find the answer when we go back. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 22. Here's what it says. It says, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal hmm. your backslidings. You know, Sean, I looked this up in the NLT New Living Translation, and I like the way it phrases it, this verse, Jeremiah 3.22. It says this, My wayward children, says the Lord, come back to me, and I will heal your wayward hearts. So God's not saying, fix yourself, get it right, you naughty children. He's saying, come to me. Let me heal you. Let me restore your heart. 
and and that's true of us today too, isn't it? Only God will heal our hearts. Well, for here's us. the pattern. You know that I do a prophecy seminar called Revelation Speaks Peace, and the, mm-hmm. one of the things that I try to impress upon people is that prophecy works like this, and you've just demonstrated it. God shows you the reality of where you're at because mm-hmm. a loving God will tell you the truth about what you're doing to yourself. Right? He doesn't sugarcoat it. Here's the situation you're in. It is dire. You're in danger of losing everything mm-hmm. right, for all eternity. And then he always holds out hope. But I have an answer. Bible prophecy is often preached by modern preachers saying, see, God is angry at you and he's trying to wipe you out. No. Does God get angry? There's no question. He talks about my fury comes forth like fire and so on. He's yeah. angry about sin and what it's done. No question about it. He does have wrath against sin. But he wouldn't bother sending Jeremiah if he didn't love. Right. And so he's saying, look, here's the way out. Just come back, man. I can yeah. fix this. I can I can fix it in a moment if your heart, if you desire it. Essentially, it's their choice. He's saying, all you have to do is turn to me and say you want that restoration, that hope, and it is yours. You just have to ask for it. I think I, I, I know that you're never going to get through what we want to cover today, <laughs> but I want to underline this because it's so okay. important. Somebody listening right now, mm-hmm. you know that your life has condemned you. You can look at the mess that you're in, and it's bad. And you've paid some prices for some of the decisions you've made along the way. And the temptation is, at that moment, is to think, God must hate me. Look at the wreck of my life. I've lost my marriage. I've lost my kids. I've lost my dignity. I've lost my sobriety. I've lost all of these things. And I'm a wreck. Mm-hmm. And I think you ought to look at it. God God will be agree with you. He'll agree with you. Yes, you are a disaster. And mm-hmm. the reason you're a disaster is because you didn't listen. I would have loved to have spared you this return you backsliding children i can heal you and i know somebody listening i will heal you. i will heal you Mm -hmm. you're right it doesn't say can Mm -hmm. i will do this this Mm -hmm. is what i want to do it's like the leper saying to jesus if you will you could heal me and jesus said yes i will i want to that's the heart of god i don't care how bad your mess is right now i hope you don't mind me i'm diverting we'll never get through this topic but this is big your life is a disaster And maybe you've listened to people who say, God must hate you. And maybe you're just tempted to feel that yourself. What he's saying to you right now is, I want something better for you. I will heal you. I Mm -hmm. will. Mm -hmm. Please come back. You don't have to be perfect to come back. You don't have to be sinless to come back. You take those first steps toward me, and I'll catch you. Mm -hmm. This can be over. Mm -hmm. I will heal your backslidings. I love that one that you read from the NLT. What is that one again? I will heal your wayward hearts. Wayward hearts. Your hearts. And, And as you read through this book, of Jeremiah, you see the word heart. In fact, in my devotional Bible that I, I mark up, uh, every time the word heart was there, I, I I put a pen, I made a mark of a heart next to yes, it. Yes, you it's would. Full. You would. <laughs> you draw a little, did you draw little hearts in your notebooks in high school? Oh, probably. Yeah, yes, all right. All yes. Right. <laughs> but God wants to heal us. Yes, he, he does. He, he, first, he wants us to wholeheartedly serve him and love him, and then he wants to heal our hearts through that process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So come back to me. God's begging. Um, He tells the truth. You've messed up. And I think the first step is recognizing, yep, you know what? I made this mess. Mm -hmm. That's what God calls repentance and confession. Mm -hmm. This is me. I did it. Come back. Mm -hmm. I'd like to heal you. I miss you. I want you in my kingdom, and I hate to see you hurt like this. Mm -hmm. And as my favorite verse says, Jeremiah 29, 11, it's because he wants to give us a future and a hope. That's it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. Time for the break. And I know I interjected and stole three of your precious minutes, but it seems (laughs) like how do we pass that verse and not say something? I will heal your wayward hearts. God will do that for you. We're going to take a little break. Maybe you want to take advantage of some of our resources at VOP to discover more about this God who wants to help you. We'll be right back. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions? Like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers that you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? 
and a second chance at life. You'll find answers to the things that matter the most to you. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. You know what I forgot to do during the last break? Open the door. I didn't get up and open the door, and now it's hot as blazes <laughs> it's in hot here again. In here. I'm trying to think of another analogy. It is as hot. It is as hot as my wife's wrath in here. Oh my! Yeah, wow. I can't think of too many occasions where your wrath was so hot that I felt uncomfortable. That's but I have few? managed. There come on, in 26 years almost of marriage, I have managed to anger you once or twice. Uh, yeah, probably a few more times than yeah. once or twice. Do you think men anger their wives more, or do women anger their husbands more? I have no idea. Yeah, I it, think it it's probably It definitely depends men. on the couple. I definitely think that men anger women more than the other way around. Maybe. Oh, I think so. I haven't, I've never I think sat so because and we pondered never, that Well, thought, we, I'm that going concept. to ponder it now tonight because I'm not sure that men ever grow up and that frustrates the daylights out of the women. Yeah, that's because, a pretty fair I don't know, general Kareem, statement. Kareem, Ruben, would you say that you guys have grown up? No. No, we can admit it, see? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Fair now, enough. The man's always the child in the room. All right. We're on Jeremiah, mm -hmm. and I have used up so much of your time, but I think there are some important touch points. Mm -hmm. We see that the point of prophecy is God showing you the reality of what you look like. He's holding up the mirror saying, you are on a crash course for disaster, but please come back to me. I will heal right. you. Right. Heal is an interesting word. It's not just forgive. I will heal you. Yeah. I will turn you around. I will make you something that you are not. Mm -hmm. So Jeremiah mm -hmm. preaches for 40 years. There are five kings <laughs> during that time. That's right. Zedekiah, the last one, the gun that was blinded. Nebuchadnezzar killed his kids in front of him, then popped his eyes out and took him prisoner. Yeah. Popped Not his pretty. eyes out. That got very graphic, didn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> Spooned his eyeballs out with Gouged a rusty teaspoon. is the yeah. word. Mm -hmm. So he listens to all of these prophecies. He doesn't like what he hears. No. Um, and then he pays the consequence. Turns out Jeremiah's right. God is right. And uh, then here's the interesting part. The servant of God has a hard enough life as it is, and the Babylonians begin the final siege on Jerusalem, and Zedekiah takes Jeremiah and tosses him in. Well, prison's even a generous word, isn't mm -hmm. it? Well, um, actually, in the beginning, the first prison he's in, they, they just it's described as the courtyard or oh, the that's palace right. yeah, prison. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably not too bad. But, you know, this king, Zedekiah and Jeremiah, they do, they have an interesting relationship, which, you know, I encourage our listeners to study out if they are inspired to, to dig into Jeremiah. The king doesn't listen to Jeremiah. He doesn't like to hear that he and his city and everything's going to be destroyed. Of course. And yet he has these moments where he vacillates and he brings the prophet in and he asks for his counsel. Um, but Jeremiah preached about the specific fate of Zedekiah, as we saw earlier with the other king. That would be a and little so, squirmy. That would yeah. be a little squirmy. Yeah. I, I can, I as a human, I can understand why Zedekiah didn't like that, and so he throws him into the palace prison, the courtyard prison. So here's Zedekiah's complaint against the prophet. It's actually recorded for us in Scripture, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 32. So we're jumping way ahead. There's a whole lot of other stuff in between we didn't talk about, but here it is, Jeremiah 32. Let's pick up in verse two. The king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up or put in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's okay, house. So that's okay, not too so he's right bad. in his house. That's right. like Paul in Rome. He kind of is yeah, in house arrest. Probably kind of cushy yeah. at that point. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up saying this. Okay. Why do you prophesy and say, thus says the Lord, behold, Gee, I, I will. Why, huh? <laughs> because the Lord says the it. The Lord That's told why. him, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape from the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon and shall speak with him face to face and see him eye to eye. Then he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall be until I visit him, says the Lord. Though you fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. And so Zedekiah, he's he's listening to this, and he does not like it, and he protests. And he's not the only one, though, right? Everybody no. is bristling. Is not just the king is bristling at this. Not at all. You know, this is the final siege on the city. This has been going on for a long time. Um, 
And Jeremiah, at this point, he is truly hated. People genuinely hate him. Uh, He preaches that the people that remain in the city, that they should surrender to the Babylonians. And that can't be popular. No, that was not popular. Uh, And so, you know, probably they argued that that would weaken their their ability to fight off the Babylonians. Yeah, I'm, I, it would if you surrender, obviously. But that's what God's asking them to do. He wants them to surrender so he can save them. Mm. And so the leaders don't like this at all. And so here we are. Jeremiah is in prison. He's in this palace prison. But the the men, the leading men, the strong men in Judah, they petition the king Zedekiah to let them kill Jeremiah. Hmm. And so Jeremiah 38, verse 6, we see this. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of um, Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon, there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk into the mire, sank into the mire. Nice. And so they take him out of what was sort of a cushy little prison, and they throw him into the bottom of this dungeon, which really, uh, historically, they say, was probably an empty underground water cistern that mm-hmm. wasn't used. So it's this huge cavern. He would have no way of crawling out, out of there. And so they leave them there. They leave him there, and they say, well, nature yeah. will take its course. There's and no the water down there. going to be sacked, and he's going to be left there yeah. Yeah, and the, and and so these these powerful men, this is their response. And you know, I love this part of the story because even when it feels like everyone is against you and the situation is completely hopeless, God has his people. He still has his people that he will work his plan through. And in this case, it was a eunuch who served in the king's house and his name is Ebed Melek or Melek. Uh, He's an Ethiopian, and he intercedes, and he pleads for Jeremiah's life. And for some reason, Zedekiah listens, and he lets Abed-Melech take 30 of the king's men, 30 of Zedekiah's men, over there to the empty cistern, and they let Jeremiah out. And so Jeremiah is lifted out, and then he's put back into the courtyard prison. He's not set free or anything. So, But at least it's an upgrade. It's an upgrade. And, you know, that when I read that, that was such... A life lesson for me because, you know, Jeremiah, he doesn't deserve to be in that prison. And I imagine when he's in that that palace prison, he's thinking about how he doesn't deserve to be there. And, and he's he was just doing what God called him to do. And then his situation got dramatically worse when he was thrown into the cistern. And God rescued him and put him back into that place where he didn't belong. However, now he had he I'm sure he had a different perspective. He now sees that prison not as a death sentence, but as a place of safety. And God really is liberating him from something that was of greater danger, greater disappointment. And so even though palace prison is not ideal, it's a place of safety. It's a place of refuge for him. And he survives. You know, Zedekiah couldn't be trusted to follow the prophet. He couldn't be trusted to follow God's counsel. And there will always be people in our lives who don't have our best interests at heart. They don't listen to God. They don't follow God's counsel. We live in a fallen world. But I'm encouraged. There are these Ebed Malaks around us too. And God, God uses them. And in fact, in this story, this man, Ebed Malak, God preserved him. He was faithful. We read about it in Jeremiah 39, starting in verse 15. Let's read what happened to him. Meanwhile, the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison. And God said to him, Go and speak to Ebed Malak the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for adversity and not for good, and they shall be performed in that day before you. So what I have prophesied, what I have said, it's going to happen. But I will deliver you. Ebed-Melech, in that day, says the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword, and your life shall be as a prize to you, because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. And so God preserves his people. He did it then, and he still does it now. 
And we, we can choose. We can choose to be one of those people who follows God's counsel and be on his side, even when everything seems desperate around us. So let me ask you this. Let, let me go off script a little bit here and ask you this. Have you ever been there as a believer? Have you ever been in a place where you think, I don't deserve what's happening to me right now? Mm-hmm. And have you ever come out the other end saying, you know what? Even there, God was there. Has yeah. that happened to you? Yeah, it has. It has. And it's, um, I mean, we are fortunate to live in the part of the world that we live in. I've never felt like my life was in danger. Right. But I have certainly felt like we have struggled um, at different phases as a family when things have happened to us. You got sick yeah, that's doing the, evangelism. <laughs> that's the one I'm thinking of. Actually. Yeah. and. And I failed. I failed. I actually didn't behave as well as Jeremiah. I remember I call it failing the Job test. At one point, I'm thinking, because I thought maybe this is it. Maybe I'm going to go. And Mm -hmm. I I actually got a little mad at God. I don't mind admitting that. It's like, really? I served you and this is what I get? Like I'm something special. Yeah, like like you deserve something different from what everyone else deserves. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And so I was absolutely there in the cistern, except I don't really see a lot of belly aching from Jeremiah at that point. He's not. Um, We... It's not recorded for us what he was thinking and feeling, but this man has been persecuted by everyone his entire God's life. God's people. This is not atheists persecuting no. him. It's his own and his own it's his family own, members. Yeah. And he stayed faithful to what God called him to do. And I, I can only guess, but I, I would imagine that in the cistern, he was resigned. Okay, go out, God. You know, you, you told me you would preserve me and you would help me. And if you are sparing me from something worse that would come with the Babylonians sie- sieging the city, then I trust you. Or if you're going to rescue me, I trust you to do that. I think it's I a big point, that. though, that just because we're faithful to God doesn't mean we escape the consequences of this world. Nope. And far too often, preachers in this day and age are preaching, look, follow Jesus. It's a ticket to easy street. You'll be prosperous. You'll do well. That is not the story told in the Bible. The story in the Bible is that we join Christ in fighting the evil that is in this world Mm -hmm. Uh, I I, I don't know, great story. Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians. Everything happens as Jeremiah predicted. Temple's destroyed. Zedekiah is taken to Babylon. He soon thereafter dies. Mm -hmm. City's abandoned. It's left in ruins. Jeremiah survives. He does. Interestingly, Nebuchadnezzar orders that Jeremiah be cared for. Right? (laughs) So the prophet's caught up in a group of people. He goes to Egypt. Mm -hmm. likely where he died unless you listen to my shows on where did the Ark of the Covenant go because there are people who believe he fled to Ireland with it. Oh, well. Yeah, there are. I don't believe that. I don't believe that, but that is one of the (laughs) theories and um, probably died in Egypt. I don't... um, We do know how he felt, though, at the end, don't we? Yeah, we do. We do. And that's in the next chapter that follows Jeremiah, and that's the book of Lamentations. Okay. And we believe that Lamentations was written by Jeremiah, and it tells us how he feels, how it affected him, the weeping prophet. Jeremiah mourns, he laments the loss of Jerusalem and her people. And in deep sadness, though, he still clings to hope. Uh, Jer- Lamentations, sorry, Lamentations chapter 3 and verses 19 to 26. Sean, I'd like to close with this because this shows the depth right, of emotion. Nine, 90 seconds. Let's go. Remember my afflictions and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And Jeremiah says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And Hmm. that's good counsel for us, too. How do you come through all that and end with God's compassions fail not, they're new every morning, great is your faithfulness? I guess he survived, everything happened the way God said. But that perspective is important for every believer. Mm -hmm. The world might be falling around you, but God is keeping his word. And God promised Jeremiah that at the beginning of the journey, and he promises that to us too. There's always hope. You picked up a lot in your early morning studies in the book of Jeremiah, and we didn't even touch a fraction of it, but I love watching you study your Bible, and I like hearing what comes out of it. If your life is falling apart, visit voiceofprophecy.com and take a look at the resources we've got to you, because there is a God of hope. The same God that was there for Jeremiah will be there for you. Amen. Until next time, this is Sean and Jean on Disclosure.